So we're going to compare how we array essentially one floor level in both Blender and in Rhino and Grasshopper. To make things exactly the same, I've modeled the single level, put it in a collection in Blender, and then imported that same level in Rhino. So here's the level that we see here, and here are the results that we get by arraying that and rotating that level within Grasshopper. Now, as you might know, in Grasshopper, you can do many more fancy things, but in Blender, again, it's still a little bit limited. And that's why I want to compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges. So let's get back into Blender now and show you how this is done. So this level is done in a collection, right? So we have something, it's really straightforward. It's just a simple level. I've put this in a collection called Floor. And then here you can see the different ways that we array it with geometry nodes. And they're using all the exact same uh, geometry nodes as you can see with just some differences so how can we tell the differences we can see them over here where it says geometry nodes so we have a count so we can change the count so let's go to 25 and now we have 25 floors and if we change the property code rotation factor and we can see it really starts to rotate it's pretty cool we can duplicate this multiples of times and the great thing about the way that this is working in Blender as instances is that it's really, really performative. It's super performative. It's, there's no lag at all around moving with these. Now, if we do the same thing in Rhino, I have tried it. It does start to lag a little bit more. In fact, even with these, if I go and edit one, and what I've done here is something slightly different where we have three examples. So if we go to this one, number slider it even takes a little bit of lag to start generating that right it's not as instantaneous i'm just going to put this back to 32 here so that's kind of how they work that's the setup node so we don't even need to look at all of this once we've generated an example once well, let's walk you through one of these so here i have one picked but let's see what's going on so we have a group input and in the input we have the count and the rotation factor then what we're doing with that is essentially creating a line. If you would like to support the work that I do and get access to the files, they are available on Patreon in the link above. I'll show you exactly how it works. So there are a number of lines and they repeat and the height of them is 3.2 meters, which is, I know the height that I modeled for this level here. So the value of the height is going in here in the Z direction and then in the offset direction. So then we're getting, in this case, 21 lines that are 3.2 meters tall. So what's the driver of our rotation? Because in geometry nodes, there is no way to set indices yet or get information about different indices. Uh, I found a really quick way and really nice shortcut to do that. And that's with an empty. The distance between, let's say, a position on the line that we just created and the empty varies. So that gives us this kind of more dynamic relationship with a, a field. It's almost like an attractor field that we get. So that's a trick that I use quite a lot with geometry nodes is having something like an empty. And then what we're doing is calculating the position of our lines to the location of our empty. And we're creating a new attribute that we are calling dist distance then that attribute we're rotating by rotation factor the rotation factor is just a multiplier of the distance between the empty in fact if we go back and plug in everything as is and move the empty around you see how the buildings start to rotate now it doesn't matter in this case where the empty is but i have put it in the center with the idea being that the taller that the lines go the more that they rotate that's the important element here it's having a difference between all the index values in a list then that distance all we're doing is converting it as an attribute it's an attribute and we're converting that to a rotation and we're doing that with a node code attribute combine where we only care about the Z and the Z's relationship. And we're calling that rotation. So once we call that rotation, it overrides the existing rotation parameter. And then we can instance the collection. We're instancing this floor collection here based on these points. So that's the first output here. So again, it's a, when you think about it, it's, it's really straightforward. We've got our base geometry. 
and we're creating lines and the height of where the lines are matches exactly our typical floor level height. And then all we're doing is measuring the distance between each line's point and the ground, which is an empty. The higher we go, the bigger the distance. So that's determining the rotation factor. And then we can multiply that rotation factor with any value that we want here, which I've created it over in this area. Next, we have a core and the core is super simple. So let's check out what the core is. That's the core, very straightforward. And let's turn all these things back on. So we're placing the core in there. And lastly, we're placing the roof. Now with the roof, there's a few notes. And the reason for all these notes is to make sure that we place the roof at the top. Because we don't have index, so we cannot get the last index in geometry nodes yet of a value. We have to go and do a couple of tricks here. The first thing we're doing is getting the count and we're subtracting it by one because computationally all the counts start from zero instead of one. And then we're multiplying that count. So it's the number of floors. So that's the height by the individual floor. So 3.2 times 20. So that's the height, the Z location of where we need to put the roof. So once we have that height, we combine it into a vector and then what we want to do is make sure that the roof has the same rotation as the rest of the faces, as the top face. To do that, we have to do the same thing that we did up here, which is get the rotation value, right? So we're first figuring out the distance between the empty and our top value. And then we're multiplying that by the same rotation factor that we have already set up and then creating a Z axis. And we're transforming that with the rotation vector and then the translation gets plugged in here and we have the geometry. So all we're doing here is transforming our geometry, we're moving it and we're rotating it where we want to. And that's the final result. So that's pretty much it. So with this, we can create multiple variations. If we want to, we can always go back to the floor and add more detail if we need to, to get this kind of result. So it does become quite flexible. I really like this approach. Again, I wish geometry nodes had a few more nodes, like I'm very used to working with lists the way we work in Grasshopper, which doesn't exist here yet. So we have to trick it a little bit. And that's what we're doing with the empty. So why would you want to do this even if it's straight? Performance reasons. So if we get the same floor and we array it, it would not perform as well as this here does. In fact, let's go with something crazy. 130 floors. We'll do the same here, 230 floors. And here, let's go to 350 floors. <laughs> Too tall, right? Really tall. But you see, it's a lot of geometry information there and there's zero lag whatsoever in here because all these are instances. So uh, computationally, it's really nice to see that this can perform so well. So that's where I see a lot of opportunity about this is doing things like this, where we just have to array something that's fairly simple and maybe give it a twist or a slight deformation. And yeah, super happy with the result. Now let's check out how this is built in Grasshopper. So here's our floor, exact same components. We'll start with the simplest one. So how do we make this? So once again, we have a factor of 3.2, which we're converting to a vector. So we get a 003.2. Pretty much the same thing we're doing in geometry nodes. And then we're creating a linear array. So we're getting the mesh. Uh, I'm putting it in a group, otherwise the linear array will get messed up. So this is a grasshopper group, not a rhino group. And we're saying the direction in which it moves. So really straightforward. In fact, this is where the information is. And then I move it a little bit later. And then to get the floor up, we have the number once again. And I didn't use list index in this case, like you would typically do in Grasshopper, just to show parity between the way we would do it in Grasshopper and in geometry nodes. We're subtracting one number, we're multiplying the factor to that, so 3.2 times 22 stories to get the top height, and then we're just moving that roof element component on top over here, and then combining that. So this is fairly straightforward because we don't have rotation. Now with the rotation, it gets a little bit more complicated, but not terribly so. So we start with the height, so 3.2 meters floor by floor, and then the number of floors, so 12. We're multiplying that, and we're, this time we're constructing a domain. 
it goes from one end to the other. So we have a number of steps. So that's good. So instead of using a distance to an empty, which is essentially a domain when you think about it, we have this built in into Grasshopper. Then we're converting these into Z, Z vectors. So these are going to give us the height. So then we first position our floors in that location. But now we have to find a way to rotate them. So we're using that range again. We're creating the vectors, which are going to be the positions from which we rotate each level. And then we're doing a simple multiplication here. So this is our factor. So this here is what helps us start to rotate it. So we get the height and we multiply it by a small factor. And then we plug this into transform and then Euclidean rotation. So what do we rotate? We rotate, rotate our geometry. So the angle is this multiplication and the plane that we're creating is the points that we're instancing those elements in. That's how we get the twist. So if we change this factor here, and we're changing the amount of twist that we have for each level. And this is the part that I really like about Grasshopper now, our list, right? So list item. So we're getting the last item in our list, and we're doing that for a number of things. First, we're doing it for the list with the Z points, so we can find the last point. So we don't need to subtract anything. And we're doing that with the rotation. So we're getting the last item in the rotation and the plane list to first move our geometry in the right place and then in there, rotate it. And you can see the difference of the rotation. And then that's all grouped together. So that's how this example here has been done. So if we move and rotate, you see how we move and we rotate this around. So what's the difference? The difference is, it's having access to list items at the moment. Otherwise, everything else works in a pretty similar way, surprisingly so. Now let's talk about the third example here, which is the exact same thing here. So we multiply the floor. In fact, what I did is just duplicated this and created it down here. This last part is just for me moving it. So we've duplicated, we constructed the domain with the points. We broke that domain down on the number of floors. And that domain gives us the Z coordinates of the instancing of each point. We move our floor onto those locations. Then we rotate based on a factor. And we can set that factor to as small or as big as we want to. And we rotate the geometry that's already in those places with the planes that we've set up, which are just the Z points, but they have to be vectors. And with the multiplication factor. And then we get the roof. Again, we're just listing the last items of all of these groups here. And first moving the roof to that location, the topmost location in our list, then rotating it with that same point with the angle that's specified as the last index. That's it. As you can see here, we could have a little bit more flexibility, but geometry nodes is flexible in a different way. If you noticed in Grasshopper, we've needed to build three separate no trees for each of those different buildings. There's no way to recycle that data. There is, we can make a group definitely and input these and output those. So that's one way to do it. And we can duplicate that group three times, but the way that it works in Blender as an experienced Grasshopper user, I find it really refreshing that we're building just one definition. There's no need to group, even though in Blender, we can also create groups that are replicated and we can move them around. And then if we duplicate this element, it has the exact geometry node set up already. So we only do it once. Let's change these numbers to something a little bit more normal, maybe a little bit higher. There you go. And this one like that. So yeah, we've got these floors here and we got this definition that if we duplicate one of these buildings, we can change these numbers independently. Super cool really flexible. I really like that system because as we already demonstrated, we can create a city of twisting towers or less twisting towers if we prefer in a very quick amount of time. Let's check it out. So you won't be able to do this as quickly in Grasshopper. You can do it if you know what you're doing, but still you would need to think a little bit more about the setup than you do here. Here we're very quick with it. 
And now we're getting away from the center line. So as you can see, we're getting these actually interesting effects. You know, the distances and how uh, it's not linear anymore, the distance between the top and the bottom item, because we have an angle. We had an angle from the empty, which is located, I believe, over here somewhere. Where are you empty? There it is. It's a little bit hidden. Let's make it a little bit larger so we can see where it is. Ah, I think I don't have the empties around. Is that it? Yeah, so you can see if we if we move the empty up and down, we get this really cool effect of everything dancing, right? Really nice. All of this is going to change. This tree is going to look completely different in Blender 3.0, which is coming out, I don't know when, in a month or two months or three months. That's all right. We'll redo it. But the, some of the flexibility is going to be exact same thing. The geometry nodes will be modified here where we can add properties, but we just won't be able to use attributes like we do here, which for these simple examples works really nicely. But for more complicated things, it becomes rather limited in my own experience. So I'm quite happy about the upcoming changes. Thank you guys for watching. And again, the files are available on Patreon in case you would like to support me and see you next time.